Hello, live from Oz. My name's Hani and this is Hugh. We're down here in Canberra on a coffee and today we're going to show you guys how to make the perfect cup of coffee. I'm an accounts manager down here in Canberra and Hugh is the head of R&D and training. So this session we're going to go into a lot of interesting stuff about coffee. I'm going to start off talking about some coffee from the farm, going through extraction, and then Hattie's going to get some awesome milk happening and we're going to have a bit of fun with it. So feel free to send some questions over the live stream and we're ready to take whatever you've got to throw at us. Um, so basically we're here in Canberra on our HQ. So this room is where we usually do a lot of preparing for barista competitions and um, getting ourselves sort of really fine tuned with what we do with our coffee. Um, I like to call Canberra the undisputed coffee capital of Australia. A lot of people in Melbourne are probably <laughs> squirming at that, but um, you know, we've got a lot of great coffee culture here. We're drinking more espresso coffee than any other city. Um, there's a lot of independent cafes all around doing amazing stuff. So we're really, really proud to be part of sort of building that culture uh, and, and hopefully taking it to another level. Um, so yeah, I guess we're gonna start off by talking a little bit about coffee. Um, coffee in Australia, is a big thing. The Italians came over with a lot of migration and brought the espresso machine. This is one espresso machine that, um, that I'm lucky enough to work with San Remo uh, in Italy. So they do do awesome coffee machines. Uh, but then the Australians started getting better and better and better at what they were doing with their roasting and extraction and all this sort of stuff. And now we can't get enough of this stuff. So I know, <laughs> I know, I know, um, yeah. Hani and I would probably have a headache if we don't drink it you know, before nine o'clock in the morning. So lucky we've had a few before we started. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about how to make a really tasty coffee. Um, the reality is with coffee, it's really difficult to make it taste good unless everything that's happened in the lead up um, you know, was correct, I guess. Um, do you know coffee sort of started? Do you know coffee started? It actually starts as a coffee cherry, so it's actually a tropical fruit. So the bean is actually the seed of that cherry. So this bright red cherry doesn't just turn up as this kind of brown bean that we know it to be. It has to go through a lot of different processes and a lot of different things before we even get it. And if one part of that chain ends up, you know not ideal, we're gonna end up with a bad tasting coffee at the end point. So understanding a little bit of that's pretty important. Um, so yeah, hey to everybody over in Germany, Italy, Norway, Nigeria. We're so happy to be here sharing some coffee knowledge with you. Hope you guys are safe. <laughs> yeah, stay safe. Um, so we're gonna get looking down here. We have a few key things about coffee that I wanted to show you before we even start. So first we have sort of roasting. Here we have basically what's called the green bean. And this is a coffee that's not roasted. So this is the seed of a coffee cherry. As it is, doesn't really taste like anything. Um, it's kind of a bit grassy. You can't really grind that up very easily. Um, but we need to put that through a roaster in order to make it taste good and to get all that flavor and aroma and all that sort of stuff that we love. So what you'll see here is a kind of progression of roasting through like that roast process. So think about roasting. It's really, really important because if our coffee is not roasted right, it's not gonna taste very good. So here we've got quite light roasted coffee. Uh, it's gonna be pretty acidic, uh, maybe a bit lemon juicy, sort of not very nice. Uh, but then if we push all the way up here, we're pushing into kind of carbon territory. So this is where coffee goes really bitter. So think about roasting, it's sort of like cooking a caramel on the stove. You're basically caramelizing sugars to a point where you want it to taste really exciting and delicious and sweet and all of that. So if we push that caramel a bit too dark, it goes toffee, eventually bitter and not very nice. So it's gonna be really difficult if I was to put that through a machine to make it taste good. So we're sitting somewhere around here in this sort of what we like to call medium roast. 
So what we're drinking today is raspberry candy. This is one of our blends. Probably Handy's favorite blend, I reckon. Definitely my favorite blend. Um, this one is based off uh, one of the World Barista Championships uh, milk-based coffees that Sasha, one of our colleagues, uh, served to win the world. It is really fruit-driven intense, so that's actually getting some of those tropical fruit flavors uh, and red berry sort of characteristics from the cherry. Um, so we have got this coffee. It has been sitting in the bag for about 30 days, tasting really, really good. Um, and we've had it closed the entire time. So we know that you know, the coffee has been sourced well. Um, it's been roasted to that right level of caramelization. But then we really have to take into account that if this isn't uh, in a sealed bag, if this is open to oxygen, uh, 30 days later, it's probably not gonna taste very good. So we've had this sitting in this closed bag with this little one-way valve that lets the gases from roasting come out but it doesn't let any of the oxygen go in. Otherwise, the coffee is not gonna taste as sweet, have as much flavor um, as otherwise. So one of the things when you're making coffee at home is breaking, if you get, just say, a kilo, break this down into small bags and keep it closed as much as you can. Uh, you're basically making things really hard for yourself if you don't store something right. So think about like wine. If you have a bottle of wine and you leave it open, week later, it's not going to taste very good, is it? So, same idea here. You're going to make things really hard for yourself if you don't store it well. Um, another thing that we do, and we do this in a lot of our shops as well, is we back coffee down and we'll freeze it. So this isn't obviously frozen, but that's all right. Um, this guy is going to sit in the freezer at its perfect sort of age. It's going to be tasting amazing. And we have reserve menus of these coffees that uh, give you a lot of different options from all the different countries that we're sourcing from. So you can try these coffees in our shops in Sydney, in Canberra, um, and it's coming soon in Melbourne as well. Um, so this is something you can do at home. You get a cheap back sealer from, from eBay or whatever, and you can back down your coffees and store it in the freezer over a longer time. So we just had a big question come in here. What's your favorite style of coffee? My favorite style of coffee, it depends on what I feel like really. Sometimes if I'm feeling like something delicate and light, I'm into filter. Um, but for me, espresso, when it's done really well, is so good. Mm. thing with espresso though, espresso can be kind of difficult. It's harder to control than the other sort of drinks because it's really concentrated. So if something's a little bit out of balance, then basically it throws the whole drink out. Uh, slaps out of, you in the face, doesn't it? Slaps you in the face. <laughs> Yeah, so the reason, um, I guess we're gonna go through some of the key steps with espresso, and like how to get that tasting good. Um, I know we spent a lot of time on that in here, um, but basically espresso needs everything to go right. So we know we've got a good bag of coffee. It's been sitting in this sealed bag with the valve. It's been stored well. It's been sitting in a cupboard. It's not been in the window with the light coming in and changing temperature and stuff. Um, so we know this is tasting good. So I've got this in a coffee grinder. Then we end up at a coffee grinder and we have no idea whether this thing is set up to make us taste the coffee. This can, you can get at any coffee grinder and you can grind shots through and they can all not run right. And you can run through a bag of coffee really, really easily um, before you sort of start getting this right to the speed of pour. Before you know it's all gone. So now we're gonna look at grind size down here. So what we can see here, we have visually two different grind sizes. So what you can see here is like a filter style of grind. It doesn't look dramatically different um, as you can see, but this will come out of the machine extremely fast. So the reason why is we don't have a huge amount of resistance because the grinds are really big. So if you think about, um, if you think about say uh, stones or, or sand if you were to pour water through stones which is sort of like this the bigger grinds it's going to come through a lot quicker if you were then to get a bunch of sand which is a lot finer smaller particles it's going to slow that water down so if our coffee doesn't flow out of the machine at the right speed we're not going to get really nice balanced flavor so what we're wanting to do is grind a little bit of coffee out of our grinder here 
and we want to visually look at it and it's sort of wanting to feel halfway between some sand and flour and should have a little bit of clumping in it. So if we don't have any clumping and the grains are really big, well, we can sort of know that we need to go finer and get it visually looking good before we sort of start running shots. Otherwise, all this coffee goes down the drain and no one wants that. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the process of sort of setting up a coffee. Have a look at uh, a few sort of shots that we're going to run, we're going to judge them, and we're going to decide how we want to sort of move forward. So our coffee is not so much like Italian coffee. Um, Italian coffee is, a, there's a lot more robusta drink there. Um, it is quite intense, very bit darker roasted than, than what we would drink a lot in Australia. Um, although things are changing as well over there. So we've got some friends that are starting to drink, yeah, very Australian style coffee there. It's taken people a long time to sort of come around to it, but it's gaining popularity. So I don't know, I think the world is starting to become more similar in the way that, you know, we're liking to drink coffee. Um, so, so we're gonna move into a bit of grinding. Um, so this is a sort of standard coffee grinder. Um, the concepts are gonna work your home grinders as well as your your grinders in a commercial setting. Um, so the idea that each grinder will grind finer or coarser, uh, which is sort of bigger or smaller grinds, and we're going to use that to control the speed of our pour and control our sort of flavor characteristics. So one thing you may not have noticed about coffee, about espresso coffee, is we use these scales all the time. So Scales are allowing us to do a coffee recipe. Coffee recipes are super important. Eh? So basically, think about if you're baking a cake. If you are, then, like let's just say you make uh, a, a souffle and you put you know, sugar and flour or whatever it goes into that and you change the quantities each time. If you uh, get you know, a great result one time and then you change uh, the number or the amount of grams of different ingredients, you get a different result and it might not be good. Same with coffee. If we don't put the same amount of coffee, for example, in the basket each time, we're going to get completely different results. Might taste good, might not taste good. Um, and we have no idea why. So there's no reference point. So it's so, so, so important to be really, really specific about measuring all of our variables. So you would say consistency is basically the key. I would say consistency is the key. Absolutely, honey. So, I've just banged out a puck of the coffee that I was drinking before. Thank God I've had some because it's really, <laughs> it's really cold down here right now. Um, so what I'm going to do basically is take you through sort of the process of making espresso coffee and some of the few key steps. So, what we're going to do is put our handle on a set of scales and we're going to basically weigh what's called our dose every single time. Now it seems a little bit overkill but it's really important because if you don't weigh your dose every time you don't know whether your shots run fast or slow because of a change in dose or whether it's a change in grind. So we want to narrow down things as much as possible. Um, yeah, it, it, it can be really, really difficult to, <laughs> to get, um, I guess coffee's, yeah, no, nah, it, it, it's fine. Uh, I guess you, when you get given coffees out, out in public, I just want to have a nice experience. I want people to just smile, be friendly, um, and to genuinely care that you're having a good time. So being an ISO is pretty difficult um, right now because I really want to go out and sort of see people in cafes and um, and get this sort of cup of love given to me in a really friendly way. Um, so speaking of love, we're going to give this coffee a lot of love. We're going to weigh this dose every single time to be about 20.5 grams, which for this coffee is a great recipe. And then we're going to make sure that that's the same every single time. So the reason why we're going to do this is if we have, for example, less coffee in the basket, there's going to be less resistance from coffee. So it's going to flow out faster. And if, flow, if it flows out too fast, 
we might not get that full development of sweetness and flavor that we want. So, chuck a little bit extra in. Doesn't even seem like that much, does it? Yeah, it's like half a gram of coffee can be the difference between a coffee tasting amazing and all right. So it's really, really important that once we know that this is exactly right each time, that we have to distribute the coffee around the basket really evenly. Because what happens is if I tamp this coffee flat, the water is going to find it easier to get through here than it through here. So Hanny, what's this? This is an on a coffee distributor. So this is a distribution tool that's made for distributing the coffee evenly around the basket. And this is going to help. We're going to do this together. Oh yes, let's do it. You spin this on the top of the group head. And as you can see, it's actually flattened it out, but it's definitely not tamping the coffee. What it's doing is creating a really even distribution of coffee at this part of the basket. And after we tamp it, it's going to reduce any chance of channeling, but also make the coffee taste really good. We're going to tamp this together. That's we can tamp together. Oh, let's do it. <laughs> so something with tamping is really important. You need to be tamping flat. With about seven kilos of pressure is my favorite. So and a way to test that is by put, you can chuck your tamp on a scale and see how hard you tamp. Um, Everyone's got a set of bathroom scales at home, and I went to, you know, came out and got a seven dollar set, and it was perfect. So we do a lot of testing for that. If you tamp really, really, really hard on a coffee, you're going to restrict the flow in the early stages of the extraction, and that can really affect the flavor of your coffee. So seven to ten kilos is a really good place to start for a lot of different coffees, um, and you can actually have a little bit of a play with going really hard and, and softer and taste the different. But yeah, we're pretty specific with that sort of stuff. So now that we've got our coffee, it's been nicely distributed, it's been tamped nice and flat. Basically what we're going to do is plug that in and immediately brew. We're gonna judge the speed of the pour. So I'll get you to come over here. Get in for a nice close shot. So this machine kind of looks a bit like a spaceship, but we've got a few numbers here that are really important. 93 and a half degrees is you know, the temperature that we want to brew at. Half a degree, to put it in perspective, will make a big difference. Here we've got our time. So we're wanting our shot to run for this coffee, 25 to 30 seconds. But it depends on how it's roasted and the recipe style. So um, we will always give suggestions on how to run, like how fast you should be running the coffee. And then here we have the mills, but that's more linked to the machine, kind of just telling how much water to give to the coffee. So we're going to plug this in. So basically you go 45 degree angle, you feel the handle pop up, and then in. And then you immediately brew. Because you don't want that coffee exposed to all that heat without any water. So here we're looking good actually. We've got some resistance in the stream about halfway up. It's got a nice colour. It's not flapping all over the place. Nice and syrupy. We were wanting that sort of runny honey-like consistency at the beginning. Then you'll see the coffee will start to change color slightly. And we're hitting what's called the blonded phase. So basically you'll see it'll thin out a little bit and it's gonna go lighter in color. So basically that blonded stage is suggesting that the coffee's sort of given what it wants to give. And we don't really wanna be extracting anymore. I'm going to plug in another couple shots. We're going to compare a few. So basically, you're pretty unlikely to get to a coffee grinder, plug a shot in, and it just runs perfect straight away. So we've got basically a few little scenarios that are going to show you exactly what you might run into day to day. So I've got another couple of shots, a few different grind settings. And we're going to judge them together. So again, OCD, make it really even. Elbow over the top helps you tamp nice and even. And then if you have your fingers and thumbs and you're touching it on the top of the basket, it can kind of give you the, that muscle, muscle memory. Um, and you can sort of start naturally tamping straighter. If you lift it up and you're finding your tamp is angled forward or whatever, 
you can just put your thumb or your finger to the high point and just rock the tamper towards that direction. So while you're sort of learning and playing with coffee, it's always good, yeah, always to look from the sides and make sure that it's nice and even. So cleaning on top, so none, none of this makes your machine dirty. So clean machines are super, super important. That's one thing that can make coffee taste really bad. If we're not flushing the coffee out from the last shot, that's gonna go into our next cup and that's not gonna taste very good. So we want to be, uh, we want to be making sure we clean that every time. Same like at the end of the day, we want to make sure this is always clean. Otherwise your coffee's going to taste a bit bitter, a bit burnt. Um, that could be just one reason on top of roast, on top of whole lot of different things. So we're going to plug this shot in and we're going to judge this pour. So usually it takes a number of shots to get a coffee dialed in, um, so to get it running the right speed. And sometimes you run into this sort of situation. So, looking at the shot, see how that's coming out a lot quicker? Is that already blonded? Almost. Already blonded. And it's gushing out all over the place. Basically, that was a 15 second shot. So, this coffee is really, really coarse. So the grinds are really, really big. It's not slowing down the flow of that water. So what we run into is the issue that we under extract that coffee. We're not gonna fully develop the sweetness. Now, if we run into that sort of situation, we wanna straight away go finer with our grind. So if you've ever had a coffee that tasted sour, really acidic, like kind of lemon juice sort of thing, it might have come from a shot that ran too fast. So now we've got another, that smells really good. Um, yeah, um, what does it smell good? like? It smells just like candy. It's super sweet. Really, really, really sweet. I was standing here in the grocery earlier this morning trying to pick a bag of coffee and I was just not awake yet and I think I made the right decision. All right, here's another shot. Having a look at this one, we have nothing coming out. There's water being applied to the coffee, but yeah, definitely not wanting to keep running that. Basically, the coffee is so fine that the water is struggling to get through. There's so much resistance from coffee. So sometimes this will come out in a real slow drip. Um, and you're then wanting to make small adjustments. For me, this is showing the grinder being way too fine. So yeah, that, that's definitely one of the things that if you know that your coffee is, um, you know, pretty close to where it needs to be um, in dose, you sh your coffee should at least come out of the spouts. We know that our dose is correct every single time. So, we're now just looking at this dial, fineness and coarseness. So, 20.5 again. Oh, perfect. Oh, look at this. Are the Amphim grinders doing the job? All right. Once you get really used to the process, it becomes really quick. So, we use these um, tools and everything in our cafes, and you need to start getting shots turning over really quickly when you get really busy. Um, so basically, I'm going to show you a few different portions of a pour. So what we have here is the early stages. It's quite dark in color. This is really high strength. If I was to pull out that side, that's what we call a ristretto. It says the first portion of a pour. Means restricted in Italian. Then we have a full espresso. And that full espresso, if you think about it, we're adding more water to coffee. So adding more water to coffee is going to sort of dilute it. And then we have our blonded stage. Look at the different color. So this is, it doesn't smell very nice. It's a bit dry. Um, it's a bit harsh. And it's also very watery. So if we have too much of this end portion in our shot, 
it's actually going to make our coffee taste a bit weaker and it's not going to you know taste that nice but we do want a right amount of dilution because see here this is a ristretto this is a super restricted shot and see how dark in color it is this is super 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 intense this is going to be really really bitter uh, a little bit astringent salty uh, because we don't have all those balancing flavors so Think about if you were to drink cordial straight. No one likes drinking straight cordial. It's too intense. Mm -hmm. it needs to be diluted to that perfect point. So espresso, when it's fully extracted and we have that um, that dilution at the right point, that coffee flavor is going to come across more balanced. Uh, our palate's going to enjoy drinking it. Um, traditionally, I guess, a lot of ristrettos were done because it doesn't fully open up and show all the characteristics of that coffee. So if a coffee is roasted, for example, really dark, we want to hide some of what that coffee has. So by doing a ristretto, you don't actually expose everything. But given coffees are roasted you know, really nice these days, everyone's like learning more and more about the flavors of coffees, espresso is sort of where you want to be sitting. Uh, they're going to have enough body. It's going to be fuller, like full enough for us to sort of really enjoy the intensity of it. So. Definitely try espresso if you haven't, if you've been a ristretto drinker your whole life. Just be open-minded and can give it a go, give it a whirl. So here we had a question. Do you know if coffee grounds can be used for anything after it's been extracted? Um, you can, yeah, you can grow, I'm pretty sure you grow mushrooms out of them, can't you? I've seen yeah. people use spent coffee grinds and, um, and yeah, they're, they're growing mushrooms out of them because they've got a lot of nutrients left. Um, face scrub, I know Jordan, one of the guys we work with, he's made some awesome face scrub before. I've um, used it, it's very nice. Cool. Yeah, so coffee scrubs. I know one, there's a really cool place in Canberra uh, called the Truffle Farm. We've been supplying them our coffee grinds for the past six months. Uh, I'm not too sure how long it takes to grow truffles, but they're um, doing an experiment doing coffee truffles. Truffle season so, in a couple of weeks. Yeah, so uh, we're going to be hopefully tasting some coffee truffles soon. So there is lots of uses, and I think it hasn't been maxed out. I think there's so many things you can do with the waste. So so we're looking at lots of different ways of minimizing waste. So things like takeaway cups, we're trying to reduce that. Uh, there's so many different areas in the coffee industry that you know we're starting to, to make steps forward in. So I think it's super important. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to pull a couple of shots and Hanny is going to start talking you through some milk. We're going to go into some of the hows. He's the man of that, so I'll just let him <laughs> Alrighty. I guess we can uh, start while he's running some shots. Hopefully if the grind is not too loud. Um, we'll talk about just jugs. Now that's going to start talking. <laughs> So a lot of people do ask um, when pouring milk, wow, well, are jugs important? I believe so. I think getting the stainless steel jugs are probably the best because they have the really high amount of conductivity so you can kind of feel the temperature quite quite instantly. Um, when filling up your milk jug, you'll notice there's a little lip on every single milk jug that's a pouring jug. And you always want to fill it up to that point there. Well, that's a really good reference, it's really easy to remember, and you can see it on the inside as well. Um, and I'll just give you an example. So there's lots of, um, wait, today we're using Riverina milk. These guys are based in Wagga. Um, we have a really beautiful partnership with these guys. We've actually collaborated making this gold milk to taste really good with our raspberry candy, so I guess we're in luck today. So. Just to give you another look at that, we are using full cream milk. Something that's really important that lots of people sometimes forget to do, even myself, um, is purging the steam one before we go straight in. Now what we're doing here is getting rid of all the water that's inside the steam one, and we're going to make sure we don't want that in our coffee, in our milk. It's going to kind of make the what does it taste like? Good. The water, not good. It's a bit, dry. It's a bit muddy. It could have a little bit of old milk from whoever used it last time, especially if they didn't purge afterwards. Now, something to pay attention to, it's going to be quite screechy and loud, but actually the sounds you're hearing while pouring milk. So I'm going to do an example of maybe a good sounding milk, and then we're going to do some examples of maybe some 
not so great ones. <laughs> um, I'll go in a bit more into positioning as well while, while we're here so we don't waste too much milk. Now I'm in the center of the jug. Usually what I'll do, especially to help you guys out, I go about halfway between the edge of the jug and the middle. And then the tip is basically just maybe I would say a centimeter away from the surface of the milk. And what this is going to do is straight away we're going to start the texturing phase as well as a kind of a vortex phase. I hope you should get a really good idea. So that noise is really good. We've got the desired texture, which is you see the surface is actually raised about a centimeter and a half. And that's going to be perfect for about two cups. So you can probably say 0.75 for each cup. So not too loud, a little bit of hissing, nothing too crazy. What's your favorite latte out to pour? My favorite latte out? I'm a classics kind of guy, so I do like just pouring love hearts and um, swans are probably my favorite. Um, you me a love heart. Do you want a love heart? Love heart's one of the easiest things to pour as well, which is really cool. Um, I'll pour one now, we can go a little bit deeper and maybe we can show each other how to pour as well, have a little pour on. Ooh. So I start thin and high. I like to give it a little swell, mix the milk and crema in together. And I just work the crema in with the milk and when I'm ready to draw the latte out, I bring the tip down to the jug as quickly as I can and then draw through to the love heart here. It's a good glossy. Yeah, so a really good sign of a good milk is glossy and you can see there's a little bit of bubbles there and that's just from me pouring. What it kind of do, just kind of give it a nice little tap on the bench and all the bubbles are gone. And as you can see, I'm always swirling the milk. This is going to keep it nice and glossy. After you texture milk, it starts to separate the froth and kind of the liquid start side of the milk. So sometimes you find when you're pouring, the froth stays in the jug. It's probably because you haven't swirled it enough. Again, mixing the crema in with the milk. Go for a swan. So down, wiggle, 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 wiggle. Stop it. Down, up. Draw the head. Is that how you do that? Yeah, that's how I do that. <laughs> so hopefully if you can see it, that's the wings of this one, the neck and the head. <laughs> I'm drinking that. Yum. I'm going to show you guys some examples of um, maybe some not so ideal things you're not looking for when you're texturing milk. So, to start off with, I'm going to texture milk that is too flat, so it doesn't have enough froth. So maybe if you do like milk, with uh, like a coffee without froth, you want to be aiming for this style of milk. And what you'll notice is I'll fully submerge the tip pretty much to the bottom. I bring it straight to the bottom. And as I turn it on, you're going to hear a pretty lovely noise. Um, you may have heard this in the... Uh, So that's kind of a noise you sometimes hear, like I always kind of hear them at service stations or uh, somewhere random where you just hear people just like kind of letting the milk screech. So what happens when you pour a coffee with that? I can give you a good example of what happens. So I can try pour some latte out here with that coffee. As you can see, it's already quite thin. And as I'm trying to pour the latte out, Nothing really comes out, unfortunately. And something you can also see is if I push these things, you can tell this one's quite liquid. That looked like your coffees when I first met you. Great. Yeah, man, we all start somewhere, so I guess you gotta remember that yes. if that is what your coffee looks like, it's not very hard to get to the next step. You just gotta practice a lot. Um, now I'm gonna give you an example of maybe too frothy milk or baby chino milk. Um, what we want to do is actually, we start with the tip pretty much out of the milk. So it kind of it kind of screeches straight in and it kind of, you'll hear a pretty loud, how hot is the milk? 
That's a really good question. So here in Canberra, we like to have our milk temperature at about 63 degrees. Um, and you'll find a lot of our cafes do that as well. And that's mainly, a lot of people consider that um, on the warmer side, like cooler side. Um, as soon as you start to texture milk above 70 degrees, the, uh, the fats, the proteins and everything that's inside the milk start to separate and maybe burn. And you kind of get that like burnt vanilla smell from the um, actual jug. Sweetness goes as well. And the sweetness kind of disappears. It kind of, it really spoils the coffee. And if you've ever seen coffee kind of separated on top of a milk, coffee and milk espresso separated, that's kind of a really good um, indication that you've probably textured the milk too hot. And temperature has a lot to do with how you taste the coffee or how you experience. As coffee cools down, you start to taste more and more. Would Especially you say if that? your coffee is done well, if it is roasted well, extracted well, as it cools down, it should get better. So sometimes if you drink a coffee at the top, it'll taste pretty good. And by the bottom, it's tasting bitter and not very nice. That's a good indication that something's gone wrong in the process. So the best thing about coffee that's done well is by the bottom of the cup it's the most delicious so you finish it and show away one another one so that's definitely a good sign of a good coffee mm. so we're gonna do some baby chino milk here again I'm starting the milk above the line of well, the surface of the milk starting the steam one above the surface of the milk so you can hear it kind of pop off straight away Wait. as you can see Something that's pretty cool to have a look at. The milk's actually doubled in size and it's quite bubbly. I'm not too sure how well you can see that. And again, trying to pour this, you'll find it kind of comes out real sludgy. And that's not ideal. So we want to be aiming for this kind of style of milk versus these two. Now, I reckon me and you should have a pour off. So if anyone's online wants to, to us to pour anything specific, we'll give it our best shot. I hope someone just goes for something outrageous yes. um, as we start to wrap it up. And if you have any questions about milk, just uh, sling them through and we'll try to get to them. All right, you take the first. I'll get that. And you're all warmed up. Yeah, I think I'll be the people's favourite. Yeah, unicorn! Wee! Wee! I reckon I can stop the people's favourite. Probably hit a unicorn, maybe. Wee! That's pretty tough, though. Depends. Depends how warmed up I am. Like, whoa! <laughs> this is just crocodile. Whoa, we got, we got a crocodile. I've seen a crocodile being done, but I don't, I don't know if I'm at that level. <laughs> You can try it. Try it in front of 30,000 people. Try and try. Yeah, that's like no pressure. I'm going to start shaking. I get really nervous in front of people. I'll text you in real quick. Whoa. A map of Australia. I reckon I can do that. I can't do a map of Australia. I'm going to try and do something real fancy. And I'm going to pull it off. You watch. Alright. And I'll try to do a unicorn, so... I guess if I fail the unicorn, you just literally have to pour anything else and we'll see what the viewers have to say. So you're going to start? I guess I'll start. <laughs> this is going to be hectic, a unicorn. I'll give it a go. It's been a while. You're so nervous, aren't you? No. Hey. Don't screw it up. I will. So, we'll start with that's his head or his mane. That's his body. His tail. His feet. Ooh. Oh, come on. I should have gone first because people would have still been sort of impressed. That's his head. 
and his little horn. I don't know if we can see that, if you can see that. <laughs> I'll explain it again. That's his, <laughs> that's his feet, that's his tail, that's his head, and I've tried to do a little horn. This is all done freestyle, so it doesn't get all right. <laughs> now from here, <laughs> we have enough trouble right, to as well. We have enough for another set. What are you going to pull? Try, oh, I'm going to try Batman. Oi, that's a classic. I haven't done that in ages. A bit shaky there, mate. Yeah, it's really cold. <sighs> kind of. What's that? Um, I need a little, <laughs> I need a little stick. And is this like an absolute fail? There's his eyes. Oh, I didn't do a cake. It's like a little man. Right. Let's do some classics, I reckon. Maybe, Maybe, my own milk. Maybe we'll do one more pour each and then we'll wrap it up. Absolutely. And while, while we're texturing milk, I'll give a quick shout out to Chad and Laura at our Oh, koala. So koala, mate. How do you do a koala? I don't know how to do a koala. Okay, you can do um, a koala. Yeah, just a quick shout out to Chad and Laura at Wildlife Australia, who we're going to be passing on to next. And also a big shout out to Live Oz for having us here today. Thanks, Thanks so much for having us. But, um, Hugh, what are you going to pour for us to finish it off? I'm going to do a... Let me try and do like a little dragon thing. Or a phoenix, or whatever you call it. Oi! Oi! Oh, buddy. Coming out of the... Oh, yes! I'm not right. a latte out for her. I just like tasty things. So we'll go for a koala. We'll just go for the just the koala's head, I reckon. So this one's really easy. You just kind of drop that for his head. Then you go to his mouth. And we've got one paw here. And I'll need a spoon here if you can grab that for me. That would be lovely, mate. Teaspoon? Yeah, that'll do, be perfect. So, I know that koalas have really cute eyebrows, right? And then they got some eyes. I know they have some little like dots on their little noses. Their little paws. Now, koalas need ears, right? They have kind of like pointy ears, don't they? Round? Oh, round? Maybe they're round. Kind of like a bear. Yeah, it's a koala's a type of bear, right? And then they have like those little indents in their ears. I'm gonna go out and see some koalas at Tip and Billa later on. It's gonna be see some koalas at, with Chad and Laura. I reckon yeah. we might oh, find some. Even better. And we got a little koala kind of trapped in his little cap. Awesome. Alrighty. Thanks so much for having us. We'll uh, see you next time. See you when you come down here. Yeah, do it. Alright. To Channel Laura. See you later. See ya. <laughs> <laughs>